Hi everyone, welcome to OpenMRS University. My name is Mike Seaton, and today I want to talk a little bit about the reporting module in OpenMRS. It's a little daunting to do a screencast on this because it's such a big module with a lot of different components. And I think I'm sort of feeling the same thing that a lot of users feel when they install the reporting module for the first time. There's a lot of links. Uh, it's unclear exactly where to go first. And uh, we just need to sort of boil it down a little bit into some fundamental components that we can work with so that we know where to go. That's what I aim to do today. You can see that I have the reporting module installed and its dependencies. It requires serialization, extreme, and HTML widgets to operate. I'm running just a demo database right now with the large demo data set from OpenMRS, so we have some data to play with. When the module is installed in the administration section, there are two sections that appear. The top section, analysis and reporting, is for end users to run reports. And the bottom section is for administrators to configure new reports. We're gonna start with the bottom section. Going to report administration, this is where I would define my reports. There are three types of reports you can define from here. Period indicator report, Rover patient report and custom report. For today, for our purposes today, I want to stay focused on the custom report because it's going to give us the best sense of exactly how a report is constructed and what its components are. It's also the most flexible and most powerful of the different report options. And it gives you the ability to have any kind of data that you want inside your report. I'm going to click on that now. We're going to call this just a test report. Uh, test report for screencast. And I'll save that. Great. So we have a report. Now what? Well, we need to figure out what this report is going to do. So maybe we want this to be a report that is run periodically and reports on data for that period. Maybe we want it to be run periodically and report on data that is true at the end of that, of, uh, as of that date. Maybe it's a location-based report, etc. So those things are useful to think about when you start out designing a report because they're gonna influence the parameters that you add to the report. Any parameters that you add to the report will be questions that are asked of the user each time they go to run the report. And then the answers to those questions, whether it's dates, locations, or whatever, can be used in the subsequent queries within the report to determine what the output results are. In our case, let's just say for this report, we want to build one which takes in a single date, which is the date that the report is run. So then I quickly added a shortcut link to add a date parameter. There's a couple of shortcuts we add because there are some pretty commonly used parameters, a single date, a start date, an end date, and a location. Many, many reports are configured with these parameters. If you're, not, if you're not happy with the default or if you want to add your own, you can just click on the add link and you can add a custom uh, parameter and you can edit any existing ones. So you can see I have a single date, its name is date and its label is date. If I go to this label, change the label to say report date. Great, now I have a parameter. You don't have to be worried about making your decisions now and having to stick with them. You can always go back and add parameters or remove parameters later on. But it's helpful to be able to make these decisions early on so we know what we're trying to create. If you'd like, you can constrict this report to run for only a certain group of patients. Maybe you're writing a report on pregnancies and so you want to restrict the port report to females. Or you're writing uh, a report on uh, patients in a certain program in your clinic and you want to restrict the uh, report to only those patients. You can do so on the report directly by specifying a base cohort definition. Now you'll see we don't actually have any cohort definitions defined in our system yet, we just created this. So when I say edit mappings, this list comes up blank. But if we go over to this cohort query section and define a couple, you'll see this is soon able to be populated and you can select from this list uh, to meet your needs. These cohort queries are ways you can define cohorts of patients. And we'll get to those in a second. 
Now, what a report really is in the reporting module is something that ties together the data and its output format. So when you see a report definition screen like this, the two most important sections are the data set definitions that define the data that goes in that report and the output designs on the bottom that define the way that you want to lay that report out and present it to the end user. Only data set definitions is required. Output designs is not. There is a default web output design that is provided by default for every, every report. So you'll always be able to look at your report on the web. But if you want to produce any kind of a custom output or to export your report into any kind of a, a format like Excel or CSV, you'll need to add an output design to do so. It's just helpful to remember that a report definition is really what just links together the data and the data set definitions and the output format and the output designs. So I think before we can think about designing our output, let's think about what data we want to put in our report. So let's add a data set definition. Now, just like with the cohort query and the base cohort definition, if I click on the new data set definition link here, this list is going to come up empty because we haven't defined any yet. So let's open a new tab and let's look at our data set definitions link that's available over here next to the report administration. So you'll see this gives you an interface where down on the left hand side there are eight different types of data set definitions that you can create. Now the reporting module aims to provide some, I'd say, proof of concept data set definitions that show what's possible, some core data set definitions that are really meant to be used extensively by end users, and it intends for the reporting framework to be extended by other implementations and other modules that want to provide their own uh, data, data set def definition implementations. All a data set really needs to do is take in a definition file and produce a data set output file. And that data set is just a table of data. So it's very easy for a module to come along that has a custom data set it needs to produce and to plug that into the reporting module as a new data set definition. <coughs> for our purposes, it's probably most straightforward for most people who are coming into the reporting module from scratch to think about a SQL data set. It's pretty common for people to be using SQL to get their data out of OpenMRS currently. Most people probably have a library of SQL statements that they run over and over to get data out and no easy place to put them, uh, to consolidate them, and to use them in a, in a over and over uh, or in different contexts. The reporting module could be that place that would allow you to do that. So you could define all of your existing SQL queries as SQL data sets. So we can go in here, we can say, this is going to be um, uh, number, so encounters, encounters by type, say. I'm trying to think of a good query we can write. And I'll submit that. Now, I've submitted, I've created a new SQL data set. You'll see I get a big query box that I can write my query in. And I have some parameters I can add. Let's start by trying to write a query. So I have one written on my other computer, uh, but I'm using a different computer now, so I'm gonna try to remember this. Bear with me. I'm gonna put this on pause while I come up with the query. And when I come back, it'll magically appear. Okay, so I've got my query magically created. You can see that it has created a simple query that uh, gets all the encounters out of my database in a certain time frame, and uh, just counts the number of those that are have each have each type. So I haven't tested this yet because I wanted to show you what happens when I add this query in. You can see that I add this in, and I save it, and I can now preview it, and that works. Okay, so it comes up as six adult initials some adult returns, some peds returns. Those are all of the encounters in my system over that 12 year span, broken down by type. Now, that's okay and all, but I'm probably gonna want to be able to not hard code the date range uh, of this query. So that's where the parameters come in. There's a nice convenience feature that allows parameters to be automatically created uh, if you specify them in your query. So for example, if I go in here and instead of saying that fixed date, 
I say colon start date. And here, instead of this fixed date, I say colon end date. The colon tells the module that that is a replacement value that should come from a parameter. So now when I save this, you'll see that two parameters are saved, start date and end date parameters, each of type date, and they're available to pass into the query. And now when I run this query, I'm prompted for those values. And if I spe specify, say January 1st, 2004, and January 1st, 2013, I get a breakdown. I don't know what I would need to do to get a different result here. I believe this demo data is from around February and March 2006. So I'm going to look at February uh, 2006 to the end of February 2006. Right, we get some different values, two adult initials and 377 adult returns during that time period. So this is a very, very, you know, relatively easy and straightforward and familiar way to define new data sets uh, for, for people who are new to the reporting module. They just want to start getting started, uh, putting their queries in and, you just, and using them. <clears throat> so now, of course, we can add this query to our report. So I'll go back to my report administration. Actually, I think I have this open over here, don't I? And I'll click on, I want to add my data set definition. And now this is populated. I have my counters by type data set. You see that I can map its start date and end date parameters in. Now, you'll see when you map a new data set into a report or you map a base query into a report, or really anything that takes a parameter into another thing that takes a parameter, you have the option of figuring out how, what you want to do with those parameters, right? Now I could, when I add this particular query into my report, I might want to hard code the start date to the start of this year or the end date to the end of this year. That might be what I want to do. But I also might want to say, well, whatever date is passed into the report, I want to reuse that date and use it in my data set definition. And so the ability, when we map parameters in, we can choose value or we can choose parameter. We could also choose expression. An expression is just something that allows us to use a parameter but to do a little bit more with it. And the main way you would do that is by arithmetic, data arithmetic primarily. So in our case, our report just takes in a single day parameter. Let's say we wanna find all encounters for, you know, for the last month in this report. So my end date, I'll map to the date of the report. That's the end. And the start date, I wanna map as an expression. I'm gonna call this date, which is the name of the report parameter in the report definition, minus 1m. So the start date should be the day of the report, minus one month, and the end date should be the day of the report. Now I'm going to give this a key, so we have a way of referencing this within the report definition, and I'll call this counters in last month. And submit that. Great. So let's preview this report and see if that works. Hit the preview button, give the report a date. Again, I have to pick something back in 2006 because of my test data. Click run. And I got one adult return in the month preceding February 1st, 2006. If I pick February 28th, two adult initials and 377 adult returns in the month preceding that report date. So it's a nice, quick and easy way to use parameters, to map them through, to use some expressions in order to make things a little bit more simple. So that's an actual report. That will work. That's all you need to do to define that report in the reporting module. Now, as I said, there's by default a single way you can view that report. And you'd have to add some custom output designs if you want to see it in sort of a different way. Let's explore that in a little bit. If we go as the end user would, would see it, we open up the reporting, the run reporting tab, we'll see that we have the report we just created as an available report. And if I click on that, you'll see that there's only one output format I can choose, red preview. You also see the report date that I specified as a parameter is available to fill out here. And as we just did, I'll fill that out as say February 28th, 2006. So we see some data. 
instead of an update to the web preview. You'll also see I can choose a cohort to run this on here. So I can either choose to put a base cohort on my report, which is always going to be run on the same base cohort, or if I want to vary the base cohort that the report runs on, I can choose it at runtime. You see, I can either run the report immediately. I can also schedule reports to run at a later point in time and on a period. So if I could want this report to run every week, every month, every year, or more custom period periodicities, I can do so. Right now, I'm just going to run it immediately. And I'll request it. And one nice thing is that all reports run asynchronously. So you can leave this page and come back. If it's a very uh, processing intensive report, a long running report, <coughs> you don't need to wait for the page to reload in order to get your results. You can come back to this page. You can get an update on its status. When it's completed, it will tell you. And then you can click on the View Report button and you can see those details. And in this case, this is the default output format. And it will tell you that the, each data set that you have in your report will show up with a tab along the top. In this case, we only have one data set. And then the data within that data set will show up as a table below it. Now going back to my report dashboard, you'll see I'll see that this report shows up as the most recent completed report. I can click back into it. I can see the details of it what the parameters were, who, who ran it and when, what its status is, I can review it again, I can choose to rerun it again, etc. Okay, but you know, running this report to the web is great for previewing it, it's a nice interface, but what we really need to do is export this out to Excel or CSV so that we can do some external analysis on it um, and send it to others for review. So what we need to do is go back into our report administration. Close some of these tabs so I know, what I, I know where I am. Go back into report administration, and I'm gonna go into my report design section, and I'm gonna add another. So you have the option of either doing it from this page, or you can go into your specific report that you've created in your editor, and you can do it in this page by adding under report output designs. This is probably a little more intuitive, so I'll do it from here. I'll click on Add, and I get a modal dialog, and I want to call this my Excel test output. Okay, Give it a description if you like. Associated with this report definition, we are on that page. And here's where I need to choose how do I want to render it. There's lots of different types of renderers that you can choose from. CSV to an Excel, Excel with a template file that you use to configure it. HTML, text, TSV, again, more Excel, XML, etc. Just like data set definitions, it's very easy for module developers to extend the reporting module by adding custom renderers that do very specific things. Right now we're working on adding BERT as a renderer option to the reporting module and by incorporating an integration with the BERT module that way. <coughs> At this point, I'm just going to choose the XLS report renderer just to output to a standard Excel output format. For this particular renderer, there's no resource files and there's no design properties I need to configure. Of course, that's not too intuitive from this interface and that's something we're working on. At the moment, you need to go to the OpenRS Wiki, Reporting Module Wiki page, and look at the documentation as to what each of the renderers do and how each of them need to be configured. In the future, we intend to have more customized user interfaces for each renderer type so that you don't need to uh, know what goes into these fields, but there's more intuitive uh, properties that you can specify on these pages to edit them. In this case, I'm going to just configure it like this. Click Submit. That's now associated here. And now I can go back into my reporting. I can click on my report. I can choose, again, a date back in 2006. And now instead of choosing web preview, I'll choose Excel test output format. I'll run this. It'll run for a second. It's not a very big report, so it won't take long to run. And now I'll view it. You can see that will open that report in Excel, and I can view it. So we can see how we can render the report to different types of outputs. And what else can we do at the running at the running stage? One of the things we talked about before was that we do have the ability to schedule the report to run at a later date. So that's pretty cool. 
we can schedule schedule to run once a week or so that we can come back in here and we can view the report output. We can have it run in the middle of the night when system utilization is low. And when we get in the next morning, the report is ready for us. We don't have to wait around for it. So that's a bonus. We also have the ability to set up report processing on our reports. So what are those report processors? Well, that's another element from the administration section. See under report designs, we have report processors. These are things that you can set up to run to handle the report output in, a, in some sort of way after it is finished running. It's really a post processor for your report. And we added this to solve two primary use cases. The first and most common was email. So often what you want to, what, what you want to do is you want to have a report run and then when it finishes successfully, you want it to email the output that is produced to a certain group of people so that they can have it at hand and know that it's been, uh, been run. Alternatively, you may want uh, an administrator to be alerted by email if a report fails to run for some reason. Another use case is for logging the report's output to disk. This could be a local file location or somewhere else on a server. Both of those processors are possible. So what you would do is you would come in, you would say you want to add a report processor, give it a name. In this case, uh, I'll call it, uh, I'm not going to set up an email report processor because my system isn't set up to do that right now. But I'll just say test logging processor. There's also a logging report processor, which is sort of a, an example report processor that we wrote initially, which just logs some output to the, to the, the log file when it runs. You'll see the other two options are the disk report processor for saving the report to disk and email report processor for emailing it out. Choose this. As you see, I can choose whether this should run when the report succeeds or when the report fails or both. And also what this mode should be. If I set it to disabled, it won't run until I enable it. So I can play around with it a little bit. It's not gonna affect any, any running reports until I'm ready. I can set it to be run automatically. On demand, meaning after the report runs, you need to explicitly uh, click a button to, to process it, or both. In this case, I'll say both. And then you need to associate with a report design. So in particular, our Excel output design. Now like report designs, there's a big configuration text area over here that it is unclear how to use. For the email report processor and the disk report processor, they re both require configuration in that section. And again, in the future, we hope that we will have uh, more user-friendly user interfaces that are more intuitive for configuring those particular processors. At the moment, we're gonna need to rely on the OpenMRS Wiki documentation in the reporting module to know what values should go in there for which re report processors. For the logging report processor, I know we don't need anything, which is one reason why I chose it. I'll save this. <coughs> that appears in my output here. Now, if I go back into my reporting section, I choose to, and I choose, whoops, to rerun my most recent report with the Excel test output, run again, output to Excel test output, you see it's running, and I have now the option to process that report with my test logging processor that I set up. As I said, combining this ability to, to have a processor that runs when the report completes with the ability to schedule reports uh, to run on a scheduled basis gives you a lot of uh, power over when reports are run, how people are notified of the results, um, <coughs> and it makes the system a lot more interactive. Right. So fundamentally, that's pretty much all you really need to know in order to use the reporting module effectively to build reports create the data sets uh, that, for the data that goes in those reports, 
design those reports so they have a particular output format and process those reports so they can be sent over email or like a disk effectively. But you can see there's a whole set of sections we didn't cover. Indicator definitions, dimension definitions, cohort queries, and data definitions. These are all very, very important and extremely interesting topics. Uh, and they are really their own self-contained projects in their own right. Cohort queries, for example, will be the basis for a revised cohort builder, which is an extremely powerful tool, completely independent of the reporting module, and which can stand alone. They're also fundamental building blocks of lots of different data set definitions, indicators, and dimensions within the reporting module. So what I should say about these is just a quick overview of what they are and how they feed into data set definitions. Again, data set definitions are what produce the data that goes into a report. Some of those data sets, as we just saw, are simple. They're just SQL data sets that you define and they get the data out that you want. But what if you don't want to have to write a complicated SQL query? Or what if you have a, a computation that's too complicated for SQL that requires lots of Java processing or, or other relations that isn't really possible via SQL? That's where these other ones come in. So for example, <coughs> or what if you just don't want to have to reuse the same uh, query over and over and over again? So that's where these different types of data set definitions come in. The cohort cross tab data set is a data set that contains a, a table of cohort definitions, which define the number of patients that should be reported on in the data set. The row per patient data set contains data definitions that contain data for each patient that should be report, reported in the data set, et cetera. And that's where these different components fit in. In other screencasts, we will go into those other components in more detail. For now, I'll just give you a little bit of a glimpse of a couple of them. Let's look at cohort queries. Let's say I want to know how many patients were adults, children, between the age of 10 and 20, 80 and 90, etc. That's where the age query comes in. Create a new age query. You can fix it. So you could say, I want all adults. And I could say, I want that to be a fixed value. I want it to be ages between 15 and up. Or I say, I want all adolescents. And I could fix it to say between uh, 10 and 15. Or I might want to write a more reusable query. So here I could write a query called age range. So in, rate, in age range on date. And instead of making this a fixed value, I'm gonna make that a parameter. I'm gonna call it min age. And age in years. I'm gonna call this, make this a parameter as well. I'm gonna call it max age. And then I'm also going to specify that I want the date on which the age is determined to be a parameter as well. So I'll call that age date and save that. Now I can run this query. I can find all my patients who are, say, between the age of 10 and 20 on 1st of January. Find all the patients who are between the age of 0 and 9 in that same age range, in the same date range. Find all patients who are between 40 and 50. All these produce different results. And you can reuse this cohort query many different times, many different contexts, by varying the parameters that you pass into it. There's lots of other examples of this. There's ways to query by gender, males and females, by encounter, patients who have or haven't had certain types of encounters, whose most recent encounter or first encounter was uh, of a certain type or at a certain date range, patients who have had date observations that match certain values, during certain date ranges or certain locations, etc. There's lots of different examples of all these around patient identifiers, person attributes, program enrollments, etc. There's also a composition query, and that allows you to and and or different cohort queries together. So for example, if I had a gender query, say males, and I want to configure that to be just males, I can save that and I can preview it. I could create a very simple composition query of these two by saying male adults. Uh, whoop. Sorry, technical difficulties. Male, uh, males between 
page 10 and 20. And my searches, those are going to be in age range on date with a min age of 10, max age of 20. Say on today. <clears throat> Michael Smith there. Another search, which is going to be males. Smith out. So now I have two, male and 10 to 20, and I can combine these together. I can and all, I can or all, or I can make a custom composition. In this case, I'm just going to make and all, 10 to 20, and male. Save that. <coughs> Preview it. Now you see I have 156 patients. You also see that you can map parameters in. Again, anytime you add something that needs parameters into something else that takes parameters, you have the option to map those parameters through. In this case, because this composition killer query didn't take parameters, but this subquery did, this subquery's only option was to use fixed values. But if we added a date parameter, to the composition query. Then we do it all of a sudden now have an option instead of specifying min age of 10 and the max age of 20 on an age date of, fi of fixed. We have, now we can say we want the age date to be a parameter. We want that parameter to draw from the date parameter of its composition parent. And now we can run this again. Choose the same value, we won't get a different value, but we can see that it works. So, cohort definitions are very powerful, and these will form the basis of the revised cohort builder when that project gets underway. In addition, the data definitions are really going to provide the main building block for the revised data export tool, as well as the patient summary module when those are developed. This is where you can define the particular types of data that you want to export for a given patient or set of patients. Here we could say, I want age on date. There's a pattern here. And I want the effective date to be a parameter called age date. Maybe I want the gender. Again, it's pretty easy to configure. There's no parameters, no properties, just need to enable it. And maybe I want most recent weight. Now, I don't know if there's any weight observations in this database, but we're going to find out. So, which is the last, meaning most recent? Question is weight kilograms. And we'll save that. There's lots more you can add. There's person data, so stuff that's good for all persons, patient data as well. So states, drug orders, and counters, patient identifiers, etc. To give this one a preview to see if there's any data behind the scenes, it might take a few seconds. And in fact, there is. The column on the left is the patient ID. The column on the right is the most recent weight for that patient. Age on date and gender would work similarly. Now these data definitions are valuable in their own right, and we can expose those calculations through the calculation module, and we can think of lots of different creative ways to use them. The primary way in which we, need, we can use them at the moment in the reporting module is via a data set. So we can go to the data set definitions page, create a new row for patient data set, and we can say, this is going to be my test patient data set. this and I can start adding some columns adding in my age on date again I don't have any parameters here so I'm just going to choose a fixed value of today call it age in 
Bender. <coughs> and I'm going to add in most recent weight. Let's call. this I should be able to go and preview that <coughs> I have a data set that has our obvious weight values gender and age and you can see that we can add that data set to our original report that I we created. Like I said, you can have as many different data sets as you want in a report. Call this one patient data. And that's gonna be our test data set. Similarly, you can have a bunch of cohort queries and you can create a bunch of data set definitions around those cohort queries. For example, the cohort cross tab data set. So maybe you wanna create a breakdown of patients based on age and gender. <laughs> so I can add as rows my males. You know what? I didn't add a female, so I'll go back to the cohort queries. Add a new gender for females. And add that as a row. Columns. I'm going to add adults as an age range on date, an age of 15, max age of nothing as of today. Call it adult. And I'll add children, an age range on date again, to an age of 0, 14. submit that. So I've used my cohort definitions to create a data set, a particular type of data set, which is a grid of cohort definitions. And again, if I go in back here and I preview that age and gender data set, I get that breakdown. And if I go in and add that to my report, I can do that as well. So I'll go into my report, I'll add my age and gender data set definition there. see what I get. Go to my test report. Give it a report date. Run it. You'll see that I have some different tabs on it coming up. There we go. Encounters in the last month. My patient data. So that's about everything there is to cover with cohort queries and data definitions for now. There's a lot more to come on those in the future. I really just want to demonstrate how you could use those currently and again how you could add them to different data set definitions in order to put different data into your report definitions. Heading back to the administration page. The only area we haven't really covered yet is the area of indicators and dimensions. I'm going to leave this mainly for another call, but for now I just want to say that indicators are intended to uh, produce aggregate data that can be used on your typical indicator reports, like a, a Ministry of Health report or a funding report in which you need to report on the number of patients that fit certain criteria in your program. And dimensions are a complement to indicators that allow you to break an indicator down by uh, commonly used criteria. So if you have 10 different indicators on your report and each of those indicators needs to be broken down by adult uh, males, adult females, uh, child males, and child females, then you can create those different dimensions uh, and reuse them across the different indicators on your report. 
rather than having to create each of those combinations independently. If we explore the period indicator report from the report administration page, or the cohort indicator with dimensions data set from the data set definitions page, you'll see that there are ways in which you can add indicators and dimensions and combine them together within these interfaces. Again, this just, produ this just uses these tools to produce a different, certain type of data set whose values are uh, aggregate numbers that can be used to, uh, that you can use to report um, on indicator style reports. Each of these areas really deserves its own screencast and its own special time to go into depth. What are all the different types of cohort queries? How may they be configured? How might they be used? What are the different types of data set definitions and how might they be used? Same with the re report designs uh, and uh, the data definitions. So in the future, I hope to do more of these screencasts that go into each of these areas in detail, as well as to do some screencasts that cover how module developers can extend the reporting module and their own modules to uh, add on to the capabilities uh, to construct new reports in code rather than through the user interface, etc. But those are subjects for future screencasts. And here I'm just going to sign off to say that thank you for listening. And if you have any questions at all or want to engage me further on these topics, uh, please don't hesitate to email me on the developers list or find me on IRC, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.